this is quite possibly the entrance to the um, the airfield. Um, there looks like a guard post there and a building there. And um, this, I think, is where they used to get in. There's a post, there's a guard post there as well. Yeah, you can see the guard post there. Blue poles. I'm in a place called Oranienburg. Um, it's um, uh, inside the state of Brandenburg. Now, I'm into a special place here. Um, they built a certain aircraft which, if you're a bit of a historian or a bit of a buff like me, then you'll know, recognise it straight away. Um, it also has a dark past in this place as well. Oranienburg has a um, dark past 80, 90 years ago. It had um, two concentration camps. Uh, KZ Oranienburg and KZ uh, Sachsenhausen. Apparently the, it was the, um, the birthplace of Hitler's nuclear fusion. Uh, it's also um, a place we're going to look at now, hopefully, uh, of where the um, Heinkel factory was. So um, let's go along and have a look at what's left. Ernest Heinkel, who formed a Heinkel company, was born 24th of January 1888 in a place called Grumbach, Werten, Württemberg. After he finished school, he went to study mechanical engineering in Stuttgart. In 1911, Heinkel worked for different aircraft companies, but in 1922, he decided that he'd start his own company up. It's also this area here, which is uh, Airfield Oranienburg, was the um, place where the Heinkels were built the Heinkel bombers. From 1911 onwards, Heinkel worked for various aircraft companies, but in 1922, he decided to uh, set his own company up in his own name and design uh, and manufacture his own aeroplanes. In January of 1933, the Nazi party became um, leaders of the Germany. 1st of March 1935, Hermann Göring, who was the leader of the Luftwaffe, the Air Force, um, revealed that um, the Germany had a new aircraft industry. Even before the uh, declaration of the Luftwaffe in 1935, Ernest Heinkel was already rolling out um, the Heinkel HE 111 bomber from a place in Rostock. Now, you'll all know what a HE 111 looks like. It's got a nose cone that's glass. I think it's called a greenhouse, or it looks like a greenhouse anyway, which is virtually 180 degree, top, bottom, uh, all the way around it, really, more than anything else. And it was the most popular bomber that Germany actually had. After the Treaty of Versailles, uh, 1919, a lot of restrictions um, had been put on Germany. Uh, they couldn't have a, um, an air force. Uh, they couldn't have a, um, a navy, and I think they were restricted to about 100,000 men for the army. Well, there's a loophole in that. They could actually have, they could have an air floor, and sorry, um, an air force for the class to have, but it's got to be a civil air force. So the Heinkel 111 was actually put out as a, uh, a civil aircraft, even though it was never intended for that. There were different variations of the HE 111. They're all very distinctive. You can't. I'll put pictures on here so you can have a look what they look like. Anyway, you recognise it straight away. Um, well, funnily enough, after the war, the Allies, I think were the Allies or the Germans, put some Rolls Royce engines in it. Bit ironic that run, isn't it, really? And I think they used it up to about 1973. So I'm assuming it was the cargo, or it would have been probably actually for civil, um, for carrying people as well. They were churning out that many HE 111s that uh, the um, place at Rostock got um, overcapacitated. So the Reich Ministry of Aviation decided to bring it to where I am now. On the 18th of March 1935, the Reich Ministry of Aviation decided to set up uh, where I am now in uh, Orienburg, which was called Airfield Orienburg, or Airport Orienburg, whatever you want to call it. And it was also just outside of the V. 
a, a village called Gemeindorf. Anyway, I'll swing you round. And that there, we're going to look at that in a minute. The 1st of May 1935, this was formally set up here. That's what they call de facto. In other words, it shouldn't really have existed or did exist. That's because of the Treaty of Versailles. End of the day. Um, the Reich Ministry of Aviation held 97% of the uh, of the shares in this company. And the rest of the shares, which only 3%, was um, actually owned by Ernst Einkel, which is his own company really, but obviously the Ministry are actually funding all his, um, his work to build these planes. Now apparently, in uh, about 1939, Ernst Einkel bought the rest of the shares off the uh, Reich Ministry of Aviation. He paid something like 17.95 million Reich marks. A bloke called Herbert Rimpel, with 25 other architects, uh, started to design this place to facilitate what they needed, which building aircraft really. But as for um, the people that worked here, there was living space as well. So we designed living quarters, canteens, administration buildings, uh, facilities where they could have sports, there's a swimming pool. There was all sorts built here, just to make it more comfortable for the people that actually worked in that building. The entire facility was built between 1936 and 1937. This area was um, built over several, several areas and spread out. Uh, Vert 1 was uh, in Gemein Dorf, which is a little village. Um, then the substation area was built just south of this area as well. Uh, and the reason they did that was because they anticipated when they went to war, because that's what Germany wanted to do when Hitler came to power. They wanted to minimise the amount of damage that the Allies would do, whoever were their enemies at the time, uh, to this facility. The architects who designed this um, built in a certain factors, in other words, to withstand bombing. First of all, they had bomb-proof foundations. Then they had large glass panels, so if they didn't get bombed, they'd just get blown out. And last but not least, they had massive sliding doors. There was two brook stalls like this, uh, identical to each other. And the idea is, is uh, if one got bombed too much, then the other one could take over and carry on with the uh, building of the um, of the bombers, of the planes. Now, the reason why it's got glass in it like this is because if they were bombed, then the glass would just blow out and hopefully disperse the energy of the bomb itself. The big fire doors, I'll show you the big sliding doors there, is so that if there's any bomb damage inside, they could push the doors open quickly, that's if they weren't damaged, and get the fire brigade in here and to set the fire out. And last but not least, um, they had um, special blinds on top of the roof. So they only needed two minutes to close them off, and that what that would do, especially at night, if the uh, Allies were bombing them at night, then it would make it so it was blacked out inside. In the beginning, this place here was mainly uh, to build a Heinkel HE 111. Um, when all the parts came together, they were put into a place called the Verk 2. This is where they assembled the plane itself. This is where they put the, the guns on. This is where they put the radio equipment in. This is put the stuff that would make the plane basically fly. Once all the plane had been put together, they put, they'd have been taken to a place called the Arrival Hall, which I think is this behind me. Um, when that was here, they did three test flights, more than likely. Behind me here as well. And uh, when they were good enough to um, say they could, yeah, they passed the test, then they were sent on to whatever Air Force needed them. What you see behind me, um, they're so close to the main building, I wouldn't be surprised these could have used uh, fire engines and uh, anything to fight fires in case um, they got bombed. I think this is the administration side of the building. You can see there must be offices there, I would hazard a guess. And no doubt they were looking over the plans for the, uh, uh, for the um, aircraft. They were checking out to make sure everything was all right. They were getting results back from the test pilots to make sure everything was okay. If they wasn't, they no doubt could change things inside this building. And when everybody was happy, then the planes would go on to their other destinations. I'm at the back of the building. <coughs> Um, there is um, a sliding door here as well, 
so if one sliding door were broken or any section of it at least he hopefully could uh, get the doors open so that the fire brigade could get in and set out any fire that was um, that was blazing away These are the uh, sort of out on the side buildings where I said to you before when I was down there. These, I've got a few, these are probably just administrative buildings. And they may have draw, had plans drawn up here as well for um, different variations of this bomber and other things as well. But um, you can imagine that there'll be seats, there's plenty glass, there's plenty fresh, uh, lots of light in here. So it'd be easy to, um, uh, be easy to see things, whatever they're doing. There's a couple of uh, gantry cranes. Uh, no doubt they are to um, maybe fix things on top of the aircraft or take things off and change things and stuff like that. Nothing much left of this place. It's all been either ripped out and uh, ready for scrap or vandalised, I don't know. It would have been good if they could have made this into some kind of museum. It'd been interesting. I don't know what that is. I have no information on it. If you do, let me know. That'd be interesting. This actually moves. A strange tale to tell of a pilot, or a test, not a test pilot, um, a transfer pilot. And to a lady called Beatty Huss. I'll put you the name at the bottom here. Beatty was, um, um, she always wanted to be in the, uh, to fly an aircraft. So in the 1930s, because obviously there was no, there was a restriction on um, what planes they could actually develop. So she became a stunt pilot. Now when the war started, the Luftwaffe wouldn't let her fly in combat. So she became a transfer pilot. So she flew planes like the BF-109, the BF-110, uh, the Junkers Ju-88. She even flew the Messerschmitt Me-262, which was the very first, or one of the very first jet engine fighters to do well, actually near the end of the war. Now, when the war was over with, because BT had been flying for the Luftwaffe, and any pilot who was flying for the Luftwaffe couldn't fly anywhere else, she couldn't do that career. So she, um, she changed careers completely and dramatically. Instead of becoming a test pilot, she ended up running the very first sex shop in Germany and maybe the world. She was that successful, her business was floating on the stock market. Now that's for, uh, for a change of direction. That there on top of the roof could well be the shuttering that took about two minutes to close off, uh, especially if this place was going to be bombed at night. Another administration building. Actually, this could even be, when I look at it, it could possibly be where the pilots sat and just waited for the planes, the test pilots, that is, just wait for the planes to get ready and then they could jump in and go and test them. Besides building the uh, Heinkel planes here, which is the um, HE-111, the uh, HE-177, on the lights they did the Junkers Ju-88, and also they did uh, Dornier uh, DO-355, I think it was. That was a strange plane, that. It had a propeller on the front and a propeller on the back. It was like a somewhat similar to, if you ever watched um, Dr. Doolittle, the push me pull you type of creature. Well, that sounds like it was that type of plane. They also started to develop jet planes here. Um, one 
by the Harton brothers. One was the um, HO 9V2. Um, you'll recognise that type of plane because at the end of the war, the Americans um, managed to get hold of a prototype one or get one that may have been working. And eventually, in the Cold War, they developed it into the U 2. Now these type of new Wunderwaffen, Wonder Weapons, had, uh, had three criteria, we called the three one thousands or the thousand, thousand, thousand. First of all, uh, it had to fly a thousand kilometres an hour. Secondly, it had to have a range of at least a thousand kilometres. And thirdly, it had to be able to carry a payload of a thousand uh, kilograms. On the 18th of April 1944 and the 10th of April 1945, it's the only time that this place was actually bombed by the US Air Force. No little damage was done. Maybe they knew what was going on here. No doubt there'll be spies sending stuff back to, um, to the Allies to tell them what's going on. So maybe they just needed to keep this place um, to themselves. The only time this place stopped production, believe it or not, was the 23rd of April 1945 just a few days before the end of the war, when the Russians and the Polish um, armies took this place over. In February of 1945, uh, a test pilot called Erwin Ziller took one of these uh, Horton uh, 9V2s up for 30 minutes flight. On the 18th of February 1945, Erwin Ziller was t again testing one of these um, revolutionary new jet bombers, and unfortunately it blew up and crashed, killing him. Now, if you know anything about the B-2 bomber, the one that uh, the Americans have, apparently you can't fly that unless it's actually... You've got to use a lot of electronics to fly it, so maybe this is what this plane obviously didn't have at that time. This looks like a test pilot's uh, locker room. Uh, I did mention before about the um, dark history of Oranienburg with having two um, concentration camps. But this place as well played its part in dark history. Because these jets were being developed, uh, there was able to fly them with high reconnaissance, higher than any of the, um, the uh, Allies could actually reach. Now these new jet fighters, bombers, were, try were designed to go up to something like 68,000 feet now, because it was new technology, and the idea of these bombers was also to do reconnaissance over the Allies, over the, their enemy, um, they wanted to make sure they could fly high enough so they could do the reconnaissance and probably do the bombing as well without worry about uh, Allies attacking them, because I don't think no plane at that time could actually fly that high. But the problem was the, um, they didn't know the effects of um, high altitude testing. So between 1942 and 1943, um, the concentration camp in Dachau started to do some tests. They were doing tests on hypothermia if a pilot landed in, like for instance, a cold water, if they crashed, or if they went up, uh, like I said, up to 60,000 feet uh, to see what effects it had on the body. Um, so they could adjust. If it, that was the case, the, um, what they were in, the, either in a, a pressure suit or a mask or whatever it may be. The problem with this is they didn't experiment on pilots, they actually experimented on inmates at Dachau. So what they'd do, they would put um, these poor souls, sometimes naked or sometimes in a pilot suit, put them in cold water and then when they were near to death, try to revive them. Uh, and also they put them in a low pressure chamber uh, it actually simulates being at a high altitude and what they do is they wait until they did watch the side effects of what was going on and then before they died they would try to revive them with whatever it was whether it was drugs or with oxygen or whatever it was to try and bring them back if they possibly could and then they pass all the information on to the Luftwaffe uh, to see um, if if it worked or not the vast majority 
of these um, poor souls died in this type of action. In 1945, after the war, the Russians took over here. This mantle virtually everything, except for this uh, arrival hall, which I am studying now. And a few of the administrative buildings, but everything else has completely gone. Anything that was here um, would have been shipped back to Russia. And the Russians would have took it apart to show it worked and no doubt built something better, just like the Americans. By September 1943, this place must have been in full production. They had 14,000 slave workers, uh, must have been from the or Oranienburg and no doubt Sachsenhausen working here. At the end of the war, um, Ernst Einkel, as far as I know, wasn't prosecuted. He was just put down as though he was a follower. So it looks as though he actually got off with it. Uh, he started work on little scooters and cheap cars, but eventually he died in 1958. Uh, the Heinkel work shortly after carried on making planes in Stuttgart. Just like to say thank you for watching the video. I hope it was of some interest to you about the Heinkel and Ernst Heinkel and the place here behind me. And hopefully I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching.